Today I'm going to speak about icons of evolution, why much of what we teach about evolution is wrong. Let me begin by saying what I think science is. As a scientist myself, it seems to me that science is the search for truth. This is a quote here from Linus Pauling, winner of two Nobel Prizes, and I agree with it completely. Well, science enjoys a very high reputation in our culture, and deservedly so, because science is the search for truth. How does it do it? Science searches for the truth by comparing theories with evidence. A theory that doesn't fit the evidence we modify or discard because obviously it's not a true statement about reality. If we want our theories to be true, we check them against the evidence. That way, our bridges hold up under the weight we put on them. Our patients live through their surgeries in the operating room. Uh, and science uh, builds us computers and other uh, nice devices. And this is why science is so successful and deserves its high reputation. I'm going to talk about evolution today, and one thing I have to do is define what I mean by that. It has many meanings. One of them, uh, for example, is cosmic evolution, the history of the universe. I'm not going to talk about anything that broad. And instead, I'm going to specifically talk about biological evolution which Charles Darwin himself defined as descent with modification. What he meant by that is, first of all, descent. He viewed all beings not as special creations, but as lineal descendants of some few beings that lived in the distant past. Modification, Darwin felt, was due primarily, though not exclusively, to natural selection or survival of the fittest, which acted on random variations in a population to change it. What is the evidence for evolution? When I ask people what the evidence for evolution is, average people, biologists even, surprisingly they all give pretty much the same limited set of examples. And it's because all of us studied evolution from the same textbooks. I recently wrote a book about these examples, or at least 10 of the major ones. I called my book Icons of Evolution because I found that these examples have taken on a life of their own. They've become symbols that go far beyond the evidence and in many cases distort it. So I call them icons. The first that I discuss is the Miller-Urey experiment about the origin of life. Darwin's tree of life, the branching tree pattern that supposedly describes how life has evolved on our planet. Homology in vertebrate limbs, the similarity in bone structures between our hand and a whale's flipper and a bird's wing, for example. Vertebrate embryos, pictures that show that we look very much like fish as early embryos, uh, supposedly pointing to our common ancestry with fish. Archaeopteryx, perhaps one of the most famous fossils in the wor world. It's a, an ancient bird with feathers, but it has a reptilian mouth with teeth and a reptilian tail, and was long thought to be the link between reptiles and birds. Peppered moths, which uh, changed color during the Industrial Revolution when pollution darkened tree trunks on which they supposedly rest. Darwin's finches, birds on the Galapagos Islands in the Pacific, uh, in which a few years back, biologists actually observed natural selection in action during a severe drought. Four-winged fruit flies, genetic mutants that uh, seem to provide, for some people, evidence for how new features can arise in evolution. Uh, the long story of fossil horses, uh, fossils put together in a series showing how our modern horse evolved from a small dog-sized animal, and then the famous ape-to-human icon showing how we supposedly evolved from ape-like creatures. Well, I'm not going to talk about all of these today. I'm going to talk about six. And I chose these six partly because they illustrate the two aspects of Darwin's theory, descent and modification. The first three are Darwin's tree of life, 
homology in vertebrate limbs and vertebrate embryos. And then for modification, peppered moths, Darwin's finches, and four-winged fruit flies. I'm going to pick on a few textbooks here today uh, because they're widely used and, of course, because they suit my purposes. Uh, but these are, this particular textbook, uh, Campbell, Reese, and Mitchell, supposedly commands more than half of the market share for introductory biology courses in this country, college courses. And uh, Campbell, Reese, and Mitchell have this to say about descent with modification. Darwinism has a dual meaning. First, that modern species evolve from ancestral forms, that's the descent, and that natural selection is the main mechanism to explain the historical facts. Uh, now, there's a subtle uh, distinction here. The first claim, that is, descent from a common ancestor, is being called a fact. The mechanism is uh, the second aspect of the theory. In another textbook, uh, this is the one I used as a graduate student at uh, UC Berkeley a few years ago, a textbook devoted entirely to evolutionary biology for upper division and graduate students. Doug Fatuma wrote, descent with modification from common ancestors is a scientific fact. That is, a hypothesis so well supported by the evidence that we take it to be true. The theory of evolution, on the other hand, is a complex body of statements well supported but still incomplete about the causes of evolution, such as natural selection and mutation. And finally, the third textbook I'm going to focus on, uh, written by uh, Otto Cirk, Otto Cirk and Byers. Uh, this is also being used in undergraduate uh, introductory biology courses in colleges around the country. They have this to say. The theory of evolution states that modern organisms descended with modification from pre-existing life forms. Virtually all biologists consider evolution to be a fact. By that, the authors mean descent from a common ancestor, whereas the mechanisms of, of evolutionary change remain controversial. Why is descent from a common ancestor considered a fact? Because an overwhelming body of evidence permits no other conclusion. Now, to a scientist, that's as strong a statement as one can possibly make about something. Permits no other conclusion. Overwhelming evidence. Some of the key lines of evidence that this book lists include the fossil record, comparative anatomy, and embryology. And those happen to coincide with the first three icons I'm going to discuss. Remember now, biological evolution consists of the supposed fact of descent from common ancestors and the theory about how this happened, the mechanisms which include natural selection and mutation. Is descent from a common ancestor a fact? Well, the first thing we have to realize is that descent from common ancestors can apply at many levels. If we look at a human population, uh, I think pretty much everybody would agree that we're all descended from some remote common human ancestor. Uh, we might even apply common ancestry to other groups uh, quite uh, plausibly and with lots of support. For example, uh, the big cats hybridize so it's quite plausible that they come from a common ancestor. Darwin's theory, of course, goes far beyond that and claims that all forms of life come from a common ancestor. And the particular level I'm going to focus on here is whether common ancestry ap applies at the level of the major groups of animals, technically called the phyla, singular phylum. I'll also deal with common ancestry within classes of animals, and I'll come to that in a few minutes. So, are all animals descended with modification from common ancestors? The key lines of evidence that permit no other conclusion include the fossil record, comparative anatomy, and vertebrate embryos. Or, in my terminology, Darwin's tree of life, homology in vertebrate limbs, and vertebrate embryos. So, on to the icons. Darwin's tree of life is this. This is the only illustration in Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And in it, Darwin shows how uh, a single species at the bottom here, A, if you look at A on the left on the bottom, consists of a variety of forms which, uh, subjected to different environments over time, can diverge into different forms. 
different species. Darwin felt that uh, if this process were to continue over many, many, many generations, uh, each line here represents thousands of generations, then over uh, the course of millions of years, this single ancestral species could diverge into different species, different genera, different families, different classes, even different phyla. Now, <clears throat> if all animals were descended from a common ancestor, according to this pattern then, the major differences would appear last. The minor differences first, the major differences last. And I'm going to choose to illustrate this, seven of the animal phyla, of the several dozen animal phyla, on the far left uh, are the flatworms, tiny little flat worms. Then the nematodes, which are round worms that inhabit the soil and the ocean floor. Echinoderms include the starfish and the sea urchins. Chordates include the vertebrates, such as this fish and ourselves. Mollusks include uh, snails and uh, clams and so on. Arthropods include uh, the crab shown here as well as insects and spiders. And finally, annelids are the earthworms. These animals, these seven groups, are so radically different from each other in the structure of their bodies that these are considered major groups or phyla. And according to Darwin's theory now, they should arise last. Now this is a, a highly schematic drawing. Obviously the true history would be much messier than this. But this is to illustrate the idea that from a single common ancestor these major groups would arise over a long period of time through a long series of intermediate forms. If the fossil record were giving us an accurate picture of the history of life, we would expect something like this in the fossil record. What do we find? something strikingly different. Virtually all the major groups of animals appear fully recognizable, fully formed, at about the same time, dated right now about 540 million years ago, in something called the Cambrian Explosion. Theory versus fact. Instead of the gradual branching tree picture proposed by Darwin, what we have looks more like a lawn or an orchard with all the major groups appearing full-blown right at the start. Darwin himself knew about this and considered it a serious problem for his theory. He uh, pointed out that it could be truly urged as a valid argument against the, the theory he was proposing. But he thought that the problem would go away with future fossil collecting. And if it didn't, he argued, it was because uh, the very nature of the fossil record prevented us from getting at the truth. So here are the two main reasons given for why the fossil evidence does not fit the theory. Okay, First, the ancestors that we know were there because Darwin's theory tells us they were left fossils but those fossils were subsequently washed away or deformed by heat and pressure, and so the record is flawed. Or, possibly, the ancestors that Darwin's theory tells us had to be there were too small or too delicate to have fossilized in the first place. The problem with these excuses is that future fossil collecting has proven both of them wrong. The problem has actually become worse for Darwin. First of all, is the fossil record flawed or incomplete? We now have many fossils from before the Cambrian explosion. Certainly the record, nobody thinks the record is fully complete, but it's complete enough to give us, uh, many fossil experts believe, an accurate picture of what the record looked like before the Cambrian explosion. Furthermore, the Cambrian explosion itself is now well documented from several places around the world, most recently from one in China, where the uh, fossils are unusually well preserved and uh, show that the explosion was even wider, uh, more extensive, and more sudden than previously thought. So fossil experts who study the Cambrian explosion are inclined to believe that the explosion is real. This is a quote from James Valentine at Berkeley and his colleagues. Uh, 
The explosion is real. It's too big to be masked by flaws in the fossil record. The second reason, were, or possibility, were ancestors too small or too soft to fossilize. Well, we now have microfossils, that is fossils you can only see with a microscope, from billions of years before the Cambrian explosion. Furthermore, we have many Precambrian fossils that are soft-bodied, and it turns out that about 70% of the fossils in the Cambrian explosion itself are soft-bodied. So the idea that fossils are too small, were too small or too delicate, or animals were too small or too delicate to have fossilized, has gone out the window. Here's a quote from William Schopp, another expert on the, the phenomenon, who says, the long-held notion that Precambrian organi organisms must have been too small or too delicate to have been preserved is now recognized to be incorrect. So the Cambrian explosion is a real phenomenon. How do our biology textbooks deal with it? They actually ignore it, for the most part. Very few biology textbooks even mention the Cambrian explosion. You can look it up in the index. You can look for it in the chapter on the history of life, and there's no mention of it at all. Those that do mention of it, and some do, uh, frequently give it one line, uh, or in the case of more extensive textbooks, like uh, Fatuma's uh, graduate level textbook that I mentioned, do their best to explain why it doesn't really affect Darwin's theory. So either the Cambrian explosion is ignored or the textbooks try to explain away its significance rather than confronting it and saying this is a problem. Yet people who have studied the explosion, such as Harry Whittington, who was uh, instrumental in pioneering the study of the Burgess Shale, made famous by Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life, wrote, based on the evidence, that he feels animals may have originated more than once in different places and at different times, very unlike Darwin's theory. Now, Harry Whittington is not a creationist. In fact, uh, I'm not quoting creationists when I quote these people who are talking about the evidence in my talk. These are scientists who study the evidence, who actually, in almost every case, still think Darwin's theory is true at some level, but who frankly admit the problems between the evidence and the theory in their field. Now, <clears throat> those who want to explain away the fossil evidence of the Cambrian explosion frequently resort to molecular comparisons. And the logic of this is that if we look at the DNA in modern organisms and compare it, the more differences we find between two animals, presumably, the more distantly related they are. According to Darwin's theory then, the further back they had a common ancestor. This is a statement from the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in 1998 uh, summarizing this view. So if we go back and look at the seven animal phyla that I chose as examples in the beginning here, I've numbered them now, uh, the first thing to realize is that these studies, these molecular studies, are dealing only with existing animals. They're not dealing with fossils. We don't have DNA from 540 million years ago. So we're taking the DNA of modern animals and extrapolating backwards to try to find the pattern of the history of life. The first thing we notice is that if we construct a tree, call an evolutionary tree, based on molecules, we find that in many cases the tree does not fit a tree that we would construct based on the shape of the animal, the morphology. The tree on the left, now remember the, the black lines below the colored boxes are extrapolations from the evidence. The only evidence we have is in those colored boxes. But a tree based on morphology on the left is different from the tree based on molecules on the right. You see on the left we have flatworms and nematodes grouped together and crabs and annelid worms, earthworms. Whereas on the right, the grouping has changed radically. Even more interesting, perhaps, it, we have one molecule that we've used on the right to make this comparison. Let's look at another molecule. Presumably, if this tree is accurate, then other molecules should refine it and make it more accurate for us uh, and uh, clarify the relationships. But it turns out, that if we go looking at another molecule, 
we can find a totally different tree. Here we have on the left the molecule I just showed you with snails and annelids grouped together on the right and echinoderms on the far left. If we look at a different molecule, the mollusks end up with the echinoderms and the nematode is off by itself. But perhaps even more surprising than this, if we take the same molecule and give it to two different laboratories, we can come up with different results. Here we have the molecule I originally showed you. In the hands of one laboratory, crabs and nematodes are grouped together and the flatworm is off by itself. In the hands of another lab, the nematode and the flatworm group together and the crab is off by itself. Now, it's still conceivable that Darwin's theory is true, but there's no way, reasonably, one can argue that this is evidence that these animals share a common ancestor. We're all over the map here when it comes to the molecular evidence. And here I'm quoting from a fellow who summarized the problem a couple of years ago, clarification of the phylogenetic, that is the evolutionary relationships of the major animal phyla, has been an elusive problem because analyses based on different genes and even different analyses based on the same genes yield a diversity of evolutionary trees. That's a mess. Whatever it is, it's not a fact that these animals share a common ancestor based on the molecular evidence. So both the fossil and the molecular evidence leave us hanging. How about this line of evidence for the common ancestry of the animals? Now here, of course, I'm talking about one class, or I'm sorry, one phylum, that is the vertebrates, or animals with backbones. And this famous icon uh, compares the bone structures in the limbs of various vertebrates and shows that the, they're similar. If you look at the lineup of the bones, there's a certain uh, similarity in structure and position between these various limbs. Across the top you can see the, the one bone at the top and the series of bones that follow that kind of line up with each other. Now, this was noticed before Darwin. It was called homology, similarity of structure and position. When Darwin came along, Oh, uh, by the way, before Darwin, this similarity of structure and position was widely explained as being due to a common design. Construction on a common archetype was the word often used. When Darwin came along, he said, well, no, this, re this shows us that these similarities come from a common ancestor through normal biological processes. Well, it was a very reasonable theory that Darwin proposed, very different from the more uh, uh, abstract uh, or in some cases even creationist explanation that uh, we're dealing here with a common design or a common designer, Darwin proposed similarity because of common ancestry. So looking at the original diagram in his book, if we just look at that portion on the left there and remember that uh, initial similarities would diverge into great differences millions of years down the road. And we, we construct uh, a hypothetical sequence of fossils to fit a pattern like this. Now remember, these are all vertebrates, all in one phylum. This is a very hypothetical drawing because the fossil record is actually much messier than this. Nobody thinks that it's this neat. But let's say it was, for the sake of argument. We have at the bottom a possible common ancestor uh, diverging on the left into birds with a modern bird at the top. Archaeopteryx, uh, by the way, is the second one down. On the right, we have this uh, supposed common ancestor diverging into whales with a whale at the top. And uh, the way we would conclude this is we would trace the bone structures through these fossils back to their supposed common ancestor in the fossil record and construct this sort of uh, picture of evolutionary relationships. Well, does this demonstrate Darwin's theory of descent with modification. A few years ago, an Ohio State biologist wrote a book uh, attempting to defend Darwin's theory and refute uh, creationism. It was called uh, Evolution and the Myth of Creationism by Tim Berra. Berra used to illustrate this, uh, how biologists work comparing fossils to one another to construct these histories. He compared it to a series of Corvette automobiles. 
this is not the drawing from Barra's book, but it's, uh, he used similar automobiles in his book. And he said, if you compare a 1953 and 54 Corvette and a 54 and 55 model and so on, the descent with modification is overwhelmingly obvious. Well, what's obvious is that this is not Darwinian descent with modification. This is, in fact, construction by design. Every single one of these automobiles was built by a team of engineers, designers, uh, and the fact that they exhibit a progression in no way indicates that they are descended from one another in any sort of uh, undesigned sense. And so actually this illustration proves that a mere succession of similarities does not prove Darwin's theory. So that uh, Barra's drawing has since been called by critics of Darwinism, Barra's blunder, because it actually reveals the problem with homology. The only way you could really show that these automobiles were descended with modification from one another would be if you could show that it happened without any input from designers. You know, rust, wind, whatever. You know, some kind of natural processes could transform one automobile into another. Then you would have descent with modification. The point is, you have to specify this natural mechanism. Well, the mechanism generally cited in textbooks to account for homologous features is genetic. The idea being that similar genes are inherited by different uh, organisms, animals in this case, from their common ancestor. Because these genes control the development of the embryo, similar genes would produce homologous features. Do similar genes really account for homology? Well, it turns out that the evidence doesn't fit this pattern. First of all, there are cases where dissimilar genes are involved in the development of homologous features. Two examples are segmentation and sex determination in insects. But perhaps more striking and far more common, we have many cases in which similar genes, in some cases so similar they're interchangeable functionally, are involved in the development of non-homologous features. And two famous examples of this are limbs, which we're looking at here, and eyes. In the case of limbs, a, a specific gene, distalis, turns out to be basic to the development of appendages, limbs, in several different groups of animals. Yet the appendages are not structurally homologous and are not thought to have evolved from an equivalent feature in a common ancestor, but to have evolved independently. In the case of eyes, we have uh, an almost identical gene occurring in flies, squids, and, and uh, vertebrates, uh, a gene that can be interchanged between them, between these uh, different phyla. And yet the eyes in flies and squids and vertebrates are structurally very different from each other and are not thought to have evolved from an eye and a common ancestor. So there's a disparity between the genes and homology. The disparity has actually been known for many years. This is something written 30 years ago by a Darwinist. What mechanism can it be that results in the production of homologous organs, the same patterns, in spite of their not being controlled by the same genes? I asked this question in 1938, and it has not been answered. Well, 30 years later, in 2001, it still hasn't been answered. How do we get homologous structures from non-homologous genes? Nobody knows. But the point here is that the mechanism required to show that a succession of similarities illustrates or is evidence for descent with modification, that evidence is lacking. It has not been forthcoming. In the absence of evidence, modern Darwinists have actually redefined homology to mean similarity due to common ancestry. Now remember the initial definition of homology, even for Darwin himself, was similarity of structure and position. But for modern followers of Darwin, homology means similarity due to common ancestry. Here's a quote from famous neo-Darwinist Ernst Mayer at Harvard. After 1859, there has been only one definition of homologous that makes sense biologically. Two uh, features are homologous when they are derived from an equivalent characteristic of the common ancestor. This is a new definition of homology.
Well, the problem with this new definition of homology is that once you redefine homology this way, you can no longer use it as evidence for evolution because you would be arguing in a circle. You would be saying, in effect, features derived from a common ancestor are derived from a common ancestor. You can stick the word evidence in there if you want, but it makes no difference. It's true, of course. Features derived from a common ancestor are derived from a common ancestor, but that's not evidence. That's just a circular statement. A philosopher of biology writing uh, 16 years ago complained about this. He said, by making our explanation in the definition of the condition to be explained, in this case homology, we express not scientific hypothesis, but belief. We are so convinced that our explanation is true that we no longer see any need to distinguish it from the situation we were trying to explain. Dogmatic endeavors of this kind must eventually leave the realm of science. I agree. Finally, for Descent with Modification, we come to the story of vertebrate embryos, my favorite because I'm an embryologist. Darwin was aware of the fossil problem. He knew nothing about molecules at that point, and he knew that homology had not, well, you know, although he considered it a product of common ancestry, he couldn't prove it. He knew that he didn't have the mechanism nailed down the way one would have to nail it down to make it evidence. So for Darwin himself, what I'm about to show you was by far the strongest single class of facts in favor of his theory of common ancestry. This is it. These were drawings made by German Darwinian Ernst Haeckel uh, while Darwin was alive. And these drawings show embryos of various classes of vertebrates, animals with backbones. On the far right, if you look at the bottom row, you'll see a human uh, fetus, uh, three other mammals next to it. Then you'll see a chick moving to the left, a turtle, a salamander, and a fish. That's the bottom row. Now, if you look up at the top row, you'll see that these different classes look virtually identical in what Heckel is portraying as their first, their earliest stage. And for Darwin, this was powerful evidence that these animals all share a common ancestor because they start out looking identical as embryos. Uh, not only did they share a common ancestor, Darwin was convinced that the common ancestor actually looked something like this embryonic form. The problem is Heckel faked his drawings. There's no nicer way to put it. In 1998, in Science, the journal Science, these photographs were published. Actually, people knew at the time, in 1870, that Heckel faked his drawings. But just recently, it came out again. When this was published in Science, these are photographs of actual embryos. And you can see the top row there with the red box around it. These are photographs of various vertebrates at the stage Heckel chose as his first. And you can see just by the naked eye that they're easily distinguishable from each other. If we focus just on the classes Heckel chose, he had five classes in his drawing, uh, fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Heckel's drawings are at the top. Drawings taken from pictures of actual embryos are in the middle with a red box around them. And you can see for yourself that these are distinguishable and how much Heckel uh, fudged or distorted or faked his drawings to fit uh, the theory he was trying to prove. <clears throat> the man who published the pictures in science three years ago wrote the year before, it looks like this is turning out to be one of the most famous fakes in biology. Just last year, Stephen Jay Gould wrote in Natural History, we do, I think, have the right to be both astonished and ashamed by the century of mindless recycling that has led to the persistence of these drawings in a large number, if not a majority, of modern textbooks. And unfortunately, they're still there. Here's Heckel's drawings, uh, straight from Heckel, in Doug Fatuma's Evolutionary Biology, the book I used as a graduate student at Berkeley. Another book. Uh, this book is for high school students, Miller and Levine, Biology, the 2000 edition. Doesn't use Heckel's drawings, but a slightly redrawn version. The top row you can see is drawn to look virtually identical, although at least the fish is given a different color and different size. 
But these are still highly stylized and don't fit those photographs that I showed you from science. And yet this is being claimed as evidence for evolution. But it turns out that distorting vertebrate embryos at the stage Heckel chose as his first really isn't the most serious part of the problem. Because if we look, remember the argument was that because the earliest stages are similar, these animals share a common ancestor. If we actually look at the earliest stages of vertebrate embryos, they look even more different. Here in the green box, you can see the first uh, few cell divisions in the five classes I just showed you. Uh, I won't go into detail here, but the cleavage patterns here are radically different. If we move to the stage where the cells begin to move to form the shape of the embryo, the cell movements and the patterns they form are again radically different. So the earliest stages are even more different than the actual embryos at the stage Heckel labeled his first. So much so that developmental biologists have taken to calling this pattern the developmental hourglass, in which the embryos at the top are very different. They converge somewhat in appearance toward the middle, the red circle in the middle, which is the stage Heckel chose as his first. And then they diverge again as they approach birth or adulthood. So if we look at that middle stage there that Heckel chose as his first, of the five embryos there, two of them, the chick and the human, resemble each other at least vaguely, right? If we ignore the other three, we've got at least two of those five at that particular middle stage that look somewhat similar. And lo and behold, in Campbell, Reese, and Mitchell, those are the two that are chosen. Now here we have actual photographs, not faked photos, but as you can see, this textbook has chosen only those two embryos out of that whole pattern I showed you a minute ago that happen to look most similar and claims that at this early stage of development, the kinship of vertebrates is unmistakable. Another textbook that I'm talking about here, Autocirc uh, Auto Auto and Byers, has this picture with the uh, statement that embryological stages of animals can provide evidence of common ancestry. For example, all vertebrate embryos look quite similar to one another early in development. Well, again, you can see that they've chosen the, hit, the chick and the mammal. Uh, curiously, they've also added a turtle. Well, funny, if you look at the turtle, you can tell it's a turtle. It really doesn't look similar at all. So the picture, in a sense, uh, puts the lie to the statement in the text. But uh, if you recall from the earlier diagram, the amphibians and the fish look even more different from the turtle. Uh, <clears throat> and so even here, there's a careful selection of evidence to fit the theory. And again, the earlier stages are ignored. An embryologist writing 25 years ago wrote, it is only by semantic tricks and subjective selection of evidence, which we've just seen for our very, with our very eyes, by bending the facts of nature, that one can argue that the earliest stages of vertebrate embryos are more similar than their adults. So here we have three icons of evolution, Darwin's tree of life, homology in vertebrate limbs, and vertebrate embryos, which supposedly provide overwhelming evidence that permits no other conclusion than the common ancestry of the major groups of animals and even the vertebrates uh, within that. And yet all three of these icons distort or even fake the actual evidence. Coming now and somewhat more briefly to the more controversial aspect of Darwin's theory, that of the mechanism of modification, I'll talk about peppered moths, Darwin's finches, and four-winged fruit flies. <clears throat> First, peppered moths. The story of the peppered moth is fascinating, and large parts of it are true. About 200 years ago, in England, uh, most of these moths were light-colored. There's a red arrow in the top frame showing you the, the light-colored moth resting on a, a lichen-covered uh, tree trunk. Uh, most moths back then were light-colored, but there, were, there was an occasional dark uh, variant. Then along came the Industrial Revolution, which darkened the tree trunks with soot, as you can see in the lower frame, 
At that point, during the Industrial Revolution, the population shifted from being mostly light colored to being mostly dark colored. The theory, which is quite plausible, was that because the dark moths were better camouflaged on soot darkened tree trunks, birds ate them selectively, or rather ate the light moths who stood out and left the dark ones, and that's why the population was mostly dark colored. In the 1950s, Bernard Kettlewell did some experiments in which he released moths onto nearby tree trunks. Uh, unfortunately, he did it in the daytime. These moths normally don't fly in the daytime, so they sort of fluttered to the nearest surface, which in this case was a tree trunk. And then he watched as birds ate the more visible moths and left the better camouflaged ones. This seemed to provide actual experimental evidence for the theory, which then became the classic example in textbooks of natural selection in the wild. And so in many textbooks nowadays, we find photographs of peppered moths on tree trunks, very much like these drawings. The problem is that uh, the story is flawed. It became apparent that it was flawed when pollution was reduced uh, following the 1950s. Uh, the population actually began to shift back toward the light color which is exactly what you would expect from the theory. The problem is that the shift back happened before the tree trunks changed color again. The tree trunks were still dark, but the population started to shift back, which didn't fit the theory. So biologists looked a little more closely, and by the 1980s knew that peppered moths do not actually rest on tree trunks in the wild, except in very small numbers. Apparently, they rest high up in the upper branches, the underside of upper branches in the shadows, where they're very hard to find. And in uh, several decades of uh, field work, uh, biologists have actually found very few peppered moths resting in the wild out of the thousands that they've studied in their traps. So where do these textbook pictures come from? It turns out that every single one of them has been staged. Since peppered moths do not normally rest on tree trunks, they have to be put there artificially. Uh, in some cases, live moths are used because they're very sluggish in daylight, so they stay where they're put. But in other cases, actually, dead moths were pinned or glued to tree trunks. This is where the textbook pictures come from. Well, <clears throat> the people who made these pictures 20 years ago, when everyone thought the moths rested on tree trunks, were not committing fraud. They were just trying to take a shortcut to illustrate what they thought was actually going on in the wild. But since we've known for at least 15 years that the moths don't rest on tree trunks, I think it's very sad that biology textbooks still have these pictures, in most cases with absolutely no indication to the student that the pictures misrepresent the natural situation, and that there are now serious doubts about the story among biologists. Here's an article written by University of Chicago evolutionary biologist Jerry Coyne in 1998 in the journal Nature. Uh, he said that the prize horse in our stable of examples of natural selection has been the evolution of industrial melanism in the peppered moth, that is the darkness due to pollution. But the classic example is in bad shape and while not yet ready for the glue factory, needs serious attention. And then he said, he pointed out, by the way, I didn't quote it here, but he was embarrassed by the fact that he had taught the peppered moth example for years, as I myself have, before I knew the problems. It embarrassed him to find out that the story he had been teaching his students was wrong. And he said his own reaction resembled the dismay attending his discovery at the age of six that it was his father and not Santa who brought the presents on Christmas Eve. Quite a shock. And yet students are still being told this today. The biology textbooks, many of them still contain the pictures, and there are still no disclaimers pointing out that the pictures have been faked. So, the peppered moth is not a good example of natural selection in action. It may in fact be due to natural selection, but the point is the evidence supposedly supporting that view has, uh, is now pretty much in doubt. In another example, we do have good evidence of natural selection in the wild, Darwin's finches. These are species of finch uh, that look very similar to each other, except uh, mainly for the size and shapes of their beaks. They live on the Galapagos Islands off the coast of Ecuador in the Pacific. And uh, about 25 years ago, some biologists from Princeton University, Peter and Rosemary Grant, 
studied one species of finch, the medium ground finch, on one of the little islands in the Galapagos. And uh, I mean, the, the study was extremely careful. I mean, they went and banded birds, identified virtually every bird on the island, kept lineages of who was born to whom and uh, what the birds ate. And uh, a stroke of good fortune for the uh, grants, although not for the birds, was that in 1977 there was a severe drought, which destroyed most of the food supply, killed 85% of the birds in this population. And the grants found that of those that remained, the average beak size was about 5% larger. So the drought had killed, preferentially, birds with smaller beaks, left larger beaks because the larger beaks were better at cracking the few hard seeds that had survived the drought. So we have here a 5% increase in the space of one year. Well, some people, some textbooks in fact, extrapolate that and point out that, well, if we had a drought, say, every 10 or 20 years, you could have a 100% increase in the size of the beak in a very short time, evolutionarily speaking. And this could account for why we have different species with different beak sizes in the finches in the Galapagos. The problem is, when we look at the actual evidence, as soon as the rain returned, the average beak size in these finches went back to normal and has oscillated about that value ever since. There is no net evolutionary change here, but merely swings back and forth depending on the climate. Very few textbooks point this out in their story of Darwin's finches. In fact, here is a statement uh, from the National Academy of Sciences, sadly, uh, that Darwin's finches are a particularly compelling example of speciation, that is the origin of new species. No new species originated here, but yet it's being claimed. This is a compelling example of speciation because a single year of drought drove evolutionary change, and if this occurred once every 10 years, a new species of finch might arise in only about 200 years. No mention whatsoever of the fact that the change was completely reversed the following, in the following years. So Darwin's finches, uh, do provide good evidence of natural selection in the wild, but the small reversible effects that were observed have been exaggerated to give the impression that they show more than they really do. What we really see here are small oscillations within a species, not the origin of the species that Darwin needs. Now, the one uh, critic of Darwinism, I mean, uh, no, I'm, I've quoted several critics of Darwinism, but the one person who uh, could be considered a creationist that I'm quoting here today. Philip Johnson, a law professor at Berkeley, wrote in 1999 in the, world, in the law st uh, Wall Street Journal uh, something that I think a law professor is qualified to write. That is, if stock promoters had done this to their customers, they would land in jail. And yet, our leading scientist, the National Academy of Sciences, of Science, uh, has resorted to the sort of distortion that would land these stock promoters in jail. Well, I think this is a, a sad commentary on the state of science now. Uh, it seems to me that scientists, if anything, should be more honest than a stock promoter, certainly not less. <clears throat> so those are two primary textbook examples of natural selection. Uh, as I said, natural selection does happen, but it's trivial in my view. It doesn't show us the major changes that Darwin's theory requires. The usual explanation for this is that to get those major changes, you need genetic mutations. And we come to the last icon I'm going to discuss here. In modern neo-Darwinism, that is Darwin's theory combined with modern genetics, DNA mutations are thought to be the source of new variations, the raw materials for evolution. Now, <clears throat> mutations do happen. This is a, a drawing of a protein molecule, uh, an enzyme. The yellow uh, circles are the molecule that the enzyme interacts with. Uh, if a mutation were to occur in the right part of this large blue enzyme molecule, the slot into which that yellow molecule fits could change its size or shape so the interaction would be interfered with. 
This does happen. And in some cases, it can produce antibiotic resistance in bacteria or pesticide resistance in insects and so on. Uh, these sorts of uh, beneficial mutations at the molecular level have been found. <clears throat> For Darwin's theory, however, we need much more than changes in individual molecules. We need changes in the shape of the body or the shape of the features of the body or the behavior of the animal. <clears throat> Do we find these mutations? Well, typically, two examples that are given to students are called homeotic mutations in these genes. Uh, the one on the bottom is the original and most famous one. Uh, these are all fruit flies. On the left on the bottom, you can see a normal fruit fly head on. That's the face of the fruit fly. It has two stubby little antennae, which you can't even see in this picture. The one on the right has a mutation in one segment of GNA, uh, DNA that uh, causes the embryo to develop legs in its head in place of the antennae. And so the, uh, the mutation was called antennapedia. On the top, on the left, we have a normal fruit fly with two wings. And on the right, a picture of a mutant with four wings. Now here I've produce drawings of them to clarify. On the left top, you see those two little dots that are the normal antennae. On the bottom, the legs that have replaced them in the mutant. On the right, the red arrow points to two little features behind the wings of a normal fly called balancers or haltiers. Uh, these are essential for flight. The fly uses these to uh, balance itself and maneuver while it's flying. And in the mutant, these haltiers have been transformed into a normal-looking pair of wings. Now, the fruit fly on the left is clearly uh, disabled. A fruit fly with legs growing out of its head is not a happy camper. Uh, it's, a, it's an evolutionary dead end. It's a sideshow freak, clearly. And nobody claims that it can provide raw materials for evolution. The one on the right, however, is found in an increasing number of textbooks nowadays because it looks like an insect, I mean there are insects with four wings, even though, I mean with, yes, with four wings, even though fruit flies only have two. Maybe this is the pathway through which four-winged insects evolved. Well, <clears throat> several things to notice here. First of all, the four-winged fruit fly is not a single mutation. It's three mutations cleverly engineered in the laboratory to combine in one fly to make the extra wings. Uh, you don't find this with such clearly formed wings in nature. This is an artificial product of a genetics lab. Second of all, uh, these are not really new features. Uh, these wings are identical to the two normal wings, at least in appearance, that the fruit fly has. So we're not adding a new feature to the fly. We're merely duplicating a feature. In fact, we've gotten rid of the haltiers that the fly needs for proper flight. Worse than that, the second pair of wings is inert. It has no muscles. It just sits there. Uh, recently, uh, there was a, a PBS series, which I understand will be uh, re-aired shortly. Uh, an eight-hour series called Evolution. And in one of the segments, uh, they talk about the genetic toolbox responsible for evolution. And they illustrate it, lo and behold, with a four-winged fruit fly. Well, if you get to see the series, watch closely when that four-winged fruit fly comes on. And you can tell that the second pair of wings is absolutely inert, useless. It's a handicap. Imagine a small airplane, a private airplane, with an extra pair of wings tied to its tail which weren't functioning. You might get the plane off the ground, but you might not. Well, the four-winged fruit fly, in fact, has great difficulty flying because it's got all this extra weight, useless weight on it, uh, and no haltiers, and so it can be maintained artificially in the lab, but cannot survive in nature. So, like the Antennapedia mutation, the four-winged fruit fly is an evolutionary dead end, and I would argue that as far as the evidence shows, genetic mutations are not the raw materials for major evolutionary change because they have to be beneficial to be preserved by natural selection, and the mutations we have seen are not. <clears throat>
Now, as I said, large scale evolution requires changes in shape, not just in molecules. And there is no evidence that any mutations that we've seen produce beneficial changes in shape. None whatsoever. So, although this doesn't exactly disprove the theory, it leaves it hanging in midair with no evidence. My conclusion then, and I'll wrap it up in a few more slides, is that the most famous textbook evidences for Darwinian evolution are distorted, exaggerated, or even faked, both at the level of dissent and modification, the so-called fact and the theory, the major textbook illustrations to convince students of these two aspects of Darwin's theory, misrepresent the evidence. Furthermore, this is a systematic pattern of misrepresentation. These are not isolated textbook errors. Uh, Heckel's embryos have been around for 130 years. Uh, we've had pepper, faked photos of peppered moss for 15 years. The homology problem has been around for 100 years. Uh, these are not isolated editing mistakes. This is a systematic pattern of misusing distorted evidence to convince students of a theory. Why? What's going on here? Well, let's go back to the three textbooks I uh, showed you at the beginning. In Autocirc, Autocirc and Byers, we find the following statement. Over the course of human history, two approaches have been taken to the study of life and other natural phenomena. The first assumes that some events happen through the intervention of supernatural forces beyond our understanding. In contrast, science adheres to the principle of natural causality. All events can be traced to natural causes that are potentially within our ability to comprehend. Now the statement, all events can be traced to natural causes, obviously is a denial of any supernatural agency whatsoever. This is not merely a statement about what science can and cannot do. This is a statement about the nature of reality. In other words, this is a philosophical statement, a statement of a philosophy, a philosophy called metaphysical naturalism, the idea that nature is all there is. There is no God, there is no spirit, there is no divine agency. This is a philosophy. And yet here we have it in an undergraduate biology textbook, pretending to be science. In Campbell, Reese, and Mitchell, we have students treated to a two-page interview with Richard Dawkins, Oxford zoologist and outspoken advocate of Darwinism and atheism. And in his interview, Dawkins says the blind watchmaker, uh, the watchmaker refers to William Paley's idea in the early 19th century that uh, things about living things, uh, features of living things were designed in the same sense that a watch was designed. According to Dawkins, the blind watchmaker is natural selection, which is totally blind to the future, yet it explains the whole of life, the diversity of life, the complexity of life, the apparent design of life. That's a lot. In this same interview, students are referred to Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker, from which this term comes. And in The Blind Watchmaker, Dawkins starts right off by pointing out Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Well, that may very well be. In fact, people in this country at least have the right to be intellectually fulfilled atheists. But do they have the right to teach students in public schools about atheism in a science textbook with public money? I think not. The third textbook, the one I used at Berkeley as a graduate student, Doug Fatuma's Evolutionary Biology, is even more forthright on this issue. Among other things, Fatuma writes, Darwin made theological or spiritual explanations of the life processes superfluous. It was Darwin's theory of evolution, together with Marx's theory of history and Freud's theory of human behavior. Now I've abbreviated what he said there, but you can go check the original text if you doubt that I have done it accurately that provided a crucial plank to the platform of mechanism and materialism 
that has since dominated Western thought. Now this is a clear and explicit statement of materialistic philosophy. This is what Darwin's theory is doing. This is what it's functioning as in the hands of these textbook writers, and this is what's being taught to grade school students, college students, and graduate students in our country. Now interestingly enough, you can look at, by the way, this is materialistic philosophy, it seems to me, not empirical science. If you look at a textbook in physics or chemistry, in fact, you can look at a textbook in genetics or physiology, even ecology, perhaps. You, you'll probably find just the facts, just, just the evidence and the theory. But you open a textbook that deals with evolution, and you'll find anti-religious statements in it. You'll find a promotion of materialistic philosophy. Why? You don't get it in physics, you don't get it in chemistry, you get it in evolutionary biology. But if science is the search for truth, as I initially proposed, and it works by comparing theory with the evidence, then philosophy is another matter entirely. When a theory, such as Darwinian evolution, is embraced for philosophical reasons, and as I said, people have a right to do that, although I would rather they would be more explicit about it and not try to do it with my tax money to my children. And when they distort the evidence to fit the theory, as I have shown you that they do in many biology textbooks, science suffers. And I'll conclude with this uh, by commenting on this statement, written uh, over a quarter of a century ago by famous neo-Darwinist Theodosius Dobzhansky. It's be, been repeated many times since. I hear it, I'd say, at least once a month in one form or another. Nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. Well, first of all, it seems to me, as a biologist myself, it's not true. Uh, many things in biology uh, can be researched without any reference to evolution whatsoever. But uh, what's interesting about this statement is Dobzhansky is saying that an entire field of scientific research makes no sense except in the light of one particular theory. Now this to me is odd. It seems to me, as a scientist myself, it would make much more sense to say nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evidence. Now, if textbooks stuck to the evidence instead of believing this doctrinaire statement of Dobzhansky, it seems to me the icons of evolution would disappear. And I'd like to see that. Thank you. Many scientists admit that problems exist with Darwinian theory. However, they are unwilling to reject it until a better theory is developed. What would you replace Darwinian evolution with? If I were to tell you that I have a theory of gravity that says everything should fall upwards, it would not be right for me to claim that you need another theory of gravity to tell me that I'm speaking nonsense. And the evidence clearly falsifies my theory right off the bat. So when so many features of the larger, the general theory of Darwinian evolution uh, don't fit the evidence, it seems to me that we're justified in discarding it right off the bat. On the other hand, I do think there is an alternative theory. It happens to be the theory that Darwinism itself discarded in the 19th century in order to become the dominant theory in biology, and that's the theory of design. It seems to me that there is good evidence that some features of living things are designed. That, that is, they could not possibly be produced by the Darwinian mechanism, and they have all the features that we associate with design. Now, we all make design inferences every day. William Dembski has formalized the process by which we normally make design inferences and shown that it can also apply to features of biological organisms. The only way to rule out that extrapolation is to start off by arbitrarily denying that there could possibly be a designer. Now, this is a big question. Is there a designer 
a supernatural intelligence that had a part, part to play in the origin and evolution of life, or not? That's a huge question. It's a metaphysical question. It's a theological question. Science, by its own uh, pretensions, cannot possibly answer that question, and yet Darwinists do. They answer it right from the start by saying, no, we're not going to deal with that. We're going to explain everything without that. Uh, and then they have to distort the evidence to cram reality into their narrow box. Uh, in a naturalistic view that excludes a designer, you're left with only chance and necessity. And it seems to me that those two factors clearly are incapable of explaining what we see in living systems. The design paradigm, the design theory, expands our explanatory options to not eliminate ch chance and necessity. Chance and necessity are still there. But in addition to that, we have the possibility of design, which can, can explain certain complex specified features, as Dembski would call them, uh, which cannot be explained by chance and necessity. So I think uh, the design theory that's currently being uh, developed in the intelligent design movement is a viable alternative to Darwinian evolution. When did you first start doubting Darwinian theory? I think it was when I uh, built a cabin in the mountains of Mendocino County, California, uh, 25 years ago, and looked at the world around me and uh, felt that it could not possibly have originated as Darwin told us it did. Uh, at that point, uh, I believed the larger framework of Darwinian evolution, that is that all animals, all creatures come from a common ancestor. What I doubted was the mechanism, chance and necessity, mutation and natural selection. And so I had suspicions about the mechanism for a long time. When I entered Yale Graduate School to study theology, uh, I was actually already determined to discredit the larger philosophical claims of Darwinian uh, proponents that uh, Darwin's theory and the evidence rule out the possibility of purpose in life and a design in the universe. I was, I was already determined to discredit that because I felt it was a philosophical view that was not warranted by the evidence. But at that point, as I said, I still believed the general outline of dissent with modification. It wasn't until I went to graduate school at Berkeley to study biology and looked at the actual evidence for this so-called fact of descent with modification that I realized that the evidence was being distorted thoroughly by the underlying philosophical materialism. The fossil evidence, the embryological evidence, the anat anatomical evidence, uh, the molecular evidence, all were being distorted to fit the paradigm and at that point, I became skeptical not only of Darwin's mechanism, but also of the general pattern uh, by which all organisms supposedly evolved from a common ancestor. The fundamental prediction of Darwinian theory is a gradually branching tree, a bottom-to-top cone of increasing diversity. The pervasive pattern of natural history, however, reveals a pattern fundamentally backwards to Darwinian theory. The Cambrian explosion, for example, reveals a top-to-bottom pattern with a vast majority of the phyla appearing with relatively little species diversity. How can natural history's forest of life be reconciled with Darwin's tree of life? You start with a few differences and those gradually amplify into major differences. I mean, clearly this is what Darwin's theory leads us to expect. Clearly the fossil record does not fit that prediction. And so there's a real problem between Darwin's theory and the evidence. How do Darwinists respond to this? Well, as I've shown in my book, uh, they typically ignore the Cambrian explosion entirely. They don't even mention it, the fact that the fossils don't fit the theory. Uh, there are diagrams in leading textbooks showing basically just a redrawn version of Darwin's illustration and claim that this is the fact of evolution. This is the fossil record. They don't even mention the Cambrian explosion. Those books that do mention it 
do their best to explain it away. And they still then draw that convergence to a common ancestor somewhere below the Cambrian, even though the evidence isn't there. So uh, I have not seen a single textbook in biology from the high school to the graduate level that really frankly acknowledges the disparity between the evidence, the fossil evidence, and Darwin's Tree of Life. Is the natural history of life on Earth more accurately described as a tree or a forest? In the fossil record, uh, certainly by a forest. It's been called uh, a lawn, you know, where you have lots of blades of grass sprouting up independently. Uh, an orchard where you have different trees that may then diversify. I mean, certainly if we look at uh, the human species, uh, within a species we assume that we get diversification over time. I don't think anybody doubts that. Uh, do you get uh, more than species and genera? Do you get families and classes? Well, I'd, I would have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Maybe in some cases you would, in some cases the evidence doesn't support it. But to bring it all together to a single root at the bottom is clearly a case of the theory overriding the evidence, trumping the evidence. What have been the major criticisms of your book, Icons of Evolution? Well, almost universally, critics have uh, begun by insulting my intelligence. Uh, suddenly, a Yale PhD and a Berkeley PhD are meaningless. Uh, as one critic said, oh, anybody can get a PhD. Uh, I'm accused of uh, evil motives, uh, of uh, not understanding how science works, even though I have done doctoral and postdoctoral research and published in scientific journals. I don't understand how science works. Uh, I've been accused of uh, piling together true statements and coming to false conclusions, as though I couldn't understand elementary logic. Uh, so it's pretty typically I'm first accused uh, personally of uh, not being up to the job. The next line of defense typically is, well, the textbook icons that I describe are just simply textbook errors, just mistakes, editing mistakes. Uh, all textbooks have them, and all textbooks do have errors. I don't know any textbook that claims to be free of errors. Now, interestingly, uh, a famous, uh, well-publicized report came out last year dealing with middle school physical science textbooks, not biology, physical science, pointing out that there were lots of errors. It was embarrassing how many errors were found. The most famous, in the press releases at least, was a photo of the singer Linda Ronstad holding a microphone. And the caption of the photo read, this is a silicon crystal doped with arsenic. Obviously a mistake. In fact, if you go back to the earlier edition of the book, the, fo the same photo of Linda Ronstadt is there, and the, f the caption describes the solid-state physics in the microphone that she's using. And the next page has a diagram of a silicon crystal doped with arsenic. So the captions got switched. And this was a simple mistake. The editors immediately acknowledged it, took it out of the next edition. Uh, and, of course, uh, there was nothing else in the book to indicate that there, this was anything but a mistake. But now imagine for a moment, you have a photo of Linda Ronstad and a caption identifying her as a silicon crystal. It's in every mid middle school physical science textbook for a century. The accompanying text pushes the line that life is actually based on silicon rather than carbon. Maybe it has a diagram of DNA with all the carbon atoms replaced by silicon. So the text is pushing the theory that the photo is meant to illustrate. And when someone comes along and says, now wait a minute, that's, that's a human being, not a silicon crystal, the writers and publishers of the textbook attack the critic and defend the caption. That's what's happening in biology textbooks. These are not errors. These are part of a systematic pattern to promote a particular theory, Darwinian evolution. As soon as someone points out that the embryos don't really look like that, the response is not, oh, this is a mistake, we better take it out. The response is to attack the critic and defend the icon. 
So that's the third line of de defense then, is to defend the icon and claim that actually it's not a misrepresentation because the theory is true, so this is just an illustration of the theory, even if it's simplified. Well, <clears throat> that's not good enough. Heckel's embryos, the embryo drawings that purport to show that humans and fish look alike in early development and therefore share a common ancestor, seriously misrepresent the embryo evidence. Peppered moths don't rest on tree trunks, and gluing them there to illustrate natural selection is not appropriate in a science book, uh, and so on and so forth. These pictures misrepresent the evidence, and they shouldn't be there. They cannot be defended, it seems to me, by anybody with any integrity. Now, does that reflect on the underlying theory that's being promoted? I think it does because all of these misrepresentations grow directly out of the effort to promote that theory. They also happen to be what are purported to be the main evidences for that theory. You take those away, why should I believe the theory? Now, is there more evidence? Fine, put that in the textbooks. Take out the icons, put the other evidence in, and let's see where we stand. But until then, I think the theory is in serious trouble. Some of the best examples of Darwinian evolution, peppered moss and Darwin's finches, seem to be better examples of conservation. Moths remain moss and finches remain finches. Variation and natural selection appear to forestall extinction and produce higher taxon level stability, or stasis. Doesn't natural selection explain conservation better than it does major evolutionary change? Absolutely. I mean, in the case of the peppered moth, I don't know any biologist who seriously, well, most biologists still believe that it was a case of natural selection. Whether it was camouflage and bird predation is very much up in the air. I believe it was a case of natural selection because it happened in conjunction with the changes in the environment. Darwin's finches are clearly a case of natural selection. Uh, but as you say, in each case, what we have is temporary oscillation. The moths shift, the, the proportions of light and dark forms shift. Both were there at the beginning, both were there at the end. The moths are the same species. Uh, not only have we not explained the origin of a new species of moth, but you know, even more than that, we haven't explained where we got moths in the first place. In the case of the finches, the same thing applies. We have one species that changes slightly in its average beak size, goes back, oscillates back and forth depending on climatic changes. It's still the same species. We haven't even explained the origin of a new species of finch. So what we see in demonstrated cases of natural selection is the equivalent, the natural equivalent of what we see in domestic breeding, which of course is what Darwin argued in The Origin of Species. He used domestic breeding to make the analogy for natural selection. Well, in domestic breeding, we can produce dramatic changes in species over many generations, uh, but we always end up with a dog or a cow or a, a, a corn plant or whatever we started with, as far as we know, in our direct observation. And once we remove the selection pressure, it goes back to what it was in most cases. So we have no net evolutionary change in domestic breeding, and in observed cases of natural selection, we'd have no net evolutionary change there either. We have, as you say, stability, preservation. We have a population that has built into it at the beginning the ability to change slightly in response to the environment, but those changes actually enable it to survive the changes and come out pretty much the same at the other end. So when Darwin extrapolates those stable changes, those conservative changes, to explain how we get finches and moths and dogs and cows and corn in the first place, it seems to me it goes far beyond the evidence, and, and there's re really no direct evidence to warrant it. Neo-Darwinists would argue that mutations are constantly supplying new genetic variation for random selection to act upon. Natural selection accounts for the survival of the fittest, while random mutations account for the arrival of the fittest. Are mutations purely random, 
and what evidence exists that all genetic information was ultimately produced by undirected, purposeless, random mutations? Well, genetic mutations certainly happen. <clears throat> uh, to the best of our knowledge, they are molecular accidents, you know, errors in copying from one generation to the next in the DNA. Uh, although I've heard people argue that th those are really uh, directed somehow. And actually, there, there, is, there are some biologists who argue for directed mutations, that is, directed by the environment. Uh, I have no problem personally seeing mutations as random and treating them that way. Uh, the question is, where do they get you biologically? Well, we know of cases in, say, bacteria where a random change in a molecule, a protein molecule, can enhance a, bacteria's, a bacterium's ability to resist an antibiotic. Say the antibiotic is designed to come in and grab onto a, a particular molecule inside the bacterium and inactivate it so the bacterium dies. If that molecule, the target molecule, mutates and changes its form slightly so the antibiotic doesn't recognize it anymore, that bacterium might survive the antibiotic. And we know this happens in some cases. Actually, most cases of antibiotic resistance have nothing to do with mutation, but some do. The question is, does this explain evolution? Well, no, I don't think it does. In 150 years of studying bacteria, no new species of bacteria have emerged. You can get all the antibiotic resistance you want. It's still the same species of bacterium. In fact, when you take the antibiotic away, typically the resistance goes away too, because by changing the shape of its target molecule, the bacterium has actually crippled itself in some way, typically. So it evolves back, just like the finches, just like the moths. What Darwinian evolution needs is mutation that changes the species of the organism, the shape of the organism uh, in some major way. I mean, how would you get uh, a fish from a worm? Not by making the worm resistant to pesticides. Obviously, it takes more than that. When we look for those mutations that change the shape of the animal or the plant, we don't find them. Well, I should say we find the mutations, but they are, without exception, harmful. And the more they change the shape, the more harmful they are. Well, the interesting thing about natural selection is it weeds out harmful mutations. So instead of taking mutations in shape and producing evolution, natural selection would weed them out and keep everything pretty much the way it was. It would be a conservative force rather than an evolutionary force. And this is what we see. Would you draw a distinction between evolution and Darwinism? Uh, sure. Evolution actually uh, has many meanings. In fact, originally it meant the development of the embryo. Evolve literally means uh, roll out. So the embryo would sort of, or unfold, the embryo would unfold, and we know that this is what happens in the embryo. Uh, evolution has come to mean history, you know, so we have uh, cosmic evolution, uh, evolution of culture. Now, I, I think history is a perfectly good word, so I don't know why we still don't use it. We use evolution instead because it's sort of jazzy, but uh, it's, it's, it's taken on all those meanings. Very broad, change in general. Uh, some biologists say evolution is a change in gene frequencies. Well, that's trivial. I mean, when I have kids, their gene frequencies are different from mine, so there's evolution right there. Obviously, Darwinian evolution, Darwinism, claims much more. First of all, it claims that all creatures are descended from a common ancestor. Second of all, it claims that the differences we see in the creatures now arose primarily through natural selection acting on random variations. Now, that's a huge claim that goes far beyond those other meanings of evolution. So I have no hesitation in the right context where people understand what I'm saying. I don't hesitate to call myself an evolutionist, but I am not a Darwinist. In his book, Evolution and the Myth of Creationism, author Tim Barra likens biological evolution to the evolution of the Corvette. <laughs> 
The irony is that the evolution and descent with modification of the Corvette required intelligent design. Natural processes alone would have resulted in stasis. However, the sudden appearance of each new model clearly was the result of the intelligent modification of a pre-existing Corvette. If the evolution of relatively simple things like automobiles and computer software require continual intelligent input, why doesn't the evolution of life infer even greater intelligence? The living things that are alive today are not the ones that were alive in the past. So the composition of the living world has changed over time. There's no denying it. Uh, is that better explained by intelligent design? I think it is, in the manner of the, evol the so-called evolution of the Corvette. Uh, without that design, uh, all we would have would be a 1950 Corvette, 53 Corvette. In fact, it would be a very rusty 1953 Corvette, probably unusable. Uh, when we look at the fossil record and we see, as Gould described, that a pattern of sudden appearance, then stasis, and then disappearance in most cases, uh, I think that fits much better with the design view than with the Darwinian view. Now, Gould has modified his uh, observation to accommodate Darwinism by saying, well, the problem is that the Darwinian changes took place in a small population way over there where we can't find it. But when you think about it, all that is is an excuse for no evidence. The evidence we have points, as you say, to sudden appearance and stasis. And that pattern on its face fits better with a design model. How do you approach the question of ultimate origins? Well, I think the first thing I would say is I would approach it very humbly knowing that I probably could not provide answers to most of the questions that I would have. <clears throat> I'm not a physicist or a cosmologist, so I really cannot comment on cosmic origins and evolution. Uh, I have no problem with the idea of the Big Bang, but uh, knowing science, the history of science, I would never commit myself to it because it may very well change in the next few years. I just don't know. It's not my field. When it comes to biological evolution, uh, I know that naturalistic efforts to explain the origin of life have utterly failed repeatedly over and over again. And right now there are lots of ideas, but basically no evidence as to how life might have originated without design on the early Earth. The origin of animal body plans and the Cambrian explosion, I would say exactly the same thing. Uh, and various other things in the history of life. So how would I approach these questions? Well, uh, as a scientist, I would approach them first and foremost, as I said, humbly, knowing that I probably cannot find all the answers, but relying primarily on evidence. To me, that is the strength of science. When the evidence points away from a naturalistic origin for the ar of life, a naturalistic origin of the first cell, I believe it. I believe that evidence. I don't insist on something for which the evidence is pointing in the other direction. Uh, I have no problem uh, admitting the possibility of design. I think there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in naturalistic philosophy, and I'd be a fool to exclude them from the outset. So I don't. Now, can evidence point to design? I think maybe it can in some cases. Uh, that's presently being worked on by people like Michael Behe, who have adopted various criteria for testing design in certain features of living things. I think this is a worthwhile enterprise with a promising future. Whether any particular claim will weather uh, the uh, slings and arrows of peer review, I don't know, but uh, I think it's a worthwhile enterprise and I'm all for it. Uh, as a scientist, I want to follow the evidence wherever it leads. I do not want to exclude conclusions before I even start. And I'm afraid that's what Darwinian evolution has done for us. Are there scientific tests that might falsify the theory that all phyla shared a common ancestor? Sure. What does the fossil evidence show? What does the molecular evidence show? What does the 
embryological evidence show? And I would argue that all of those have falsified the hypothesis. Yet the, the hypothesis survives, which I think clearly indicates its philosophical basis as opposed to its scientific one. Uh, the fact of the matter is that among Darwinian biologists, it doesn't matter how much evidence there is against the common ancestry thesis, it never is questioned. Every time someone draws a, a, an evolutionary tree, a phylogenetic tree, they begin by assuming common ancestry. You have to. And so the tree will produce a common ancestor for you. You know, it just falls right out of the assumptions. <coughs> but uh, to me, this is not science. May I comment on Ernst Mayer's quote from Harvard? Uh, that no educated person seriously questions Darwinian evolution. It makes me think back on a, uh, a show with Bill Cosby years ago. Uh, someone uh, said to Bill, uh, you know, well, I, I just don't know any middle class black people. You know, you're the only one I know. And Bill's response was, well, you really should get out more. <laughs> and I think dear Ernst should get out more because there are plenty of educated people who do not accept this dogma that Darwinian evolution is a fact. It's just simply not the case. I think he's too isolated in his ivory tower. I don't know the man personally. I'm not intending to uh, attack him personally, but uh, anyone who makes a statement like that clearly is not aware of what's going on in the world. How much money is currently being spent to promote materialistic philosophy under the guise of science? Well, it's impossible to find out exactly how much money. Uh, if you look at the uh, federal budget for scientific research, uh, some millions or hundreds of millions of dollars every year are going into promoting Darwinian evolution in one way or another. Now, don't get me wrong, a lot of that money, a lot of the billions of dollars of federal money are going to very worthwhile research. Uh, and I'm not in favor of removing support for research. I'm not even in favor of removing support for research on evolution, as long as the results are reported honestly and not doctored to make them fit the theory. Uh, but clearly, for example, the uh, American Institute of Biological Sciences uh, last year, or earlier this year, uh, was seeking $500,000 from the National Science Foundation, that's our money, to uh, launch a campaign promoting Darwinian evolution in public schools. Now, I don't know whether they got the money, but they've certainly gotten money in the past. At the state and local level, we're talking about billions of dollars every year going into uh, schools, teachers, textbooks, and other teaching materials, which uh, relentlessly hammer home the message of Darwinian evolution. I think this is a shame. I think it's a misuse of taxpayer money, especially when much of what's being hammered home misrepresents the evidence and promotes a philosophy that has no place in a public school science classroom. Now, as you point out, uh, most of the American people actually don't go along with this. Uh, according to every Gallup poll that has ever been taken on this subject, about 45% of the American people believe, say they believe, that the Earth was created in pretty much its present form a few thousand years ago. Roughly another 40, 45 percent say they believe that things have changed over time, evolved if you will, but that God guided the process. Only about 10 or 12 percent say they believe in Darwinian evolution. Interestingly enough, roughly the same proportion of communists in the Soviet Union decades ago, but that's another question. Um, members of the Communist Party, I mean. Anyway, uh, this small percentage of Darwinists obviously dominates our higher education institutions. It dominates our public school system uh, through uh, various means, partly through the uh, teachers' unions. Um, and it has uh, dominated the legal profession to a large extent. Uh, it has certainly uh, empowered the American Civil Liberties Union uh, to threaten lawsuits whenever local school boards or teachers threaten to 
step out of line and teach students the truth about evolution that is the real evidence. We have many instances of this now where teachers have been reassigned to non-biological subjects, uh, have lost their jobs, uh, or otherwise been threatened if they try to teach students anything but the party line on Darwinian evolution. And so uh, naturally it doesn't happen very much. But I think uh, parents, American taxpayers and parents, don't realize how much power they really have. I mean, ultimately in this country, it is taxation with representation. And if parents uh, and, and citizens realized how their tax money is being misused and started going to their school boards, electing people to school boards who really represent them, talking to their state representatives about how their money is being used, uh, defended teachers who wanted to teach the truth, uh, I think things would change very quickly. And I'm actually confident that they will. In your own research, you studied the epigenetic factors in the development of embryos. How do you see the results of your research in light of Darwinian theory? Well, the first thing I would say is that uh, I think Darwinism, neo-Darwinism, the combination of Darwinism and modern genetics, has put blinders on biology research in the sense, in, in several senses, one of which is that it greatly exaggerates the role of DNA. Because in neo-Darwinism, the DNA mutates, that provides raw materials for evolution, natural selection changes the gene frequencies, and that's what leads to permanent change through generations. Well, this only works if the DNA contains what's called a genetic program for development. The genes control the development of the embryo. And, uh, of course, this is what we get as a, a steady diet in the uh, mass media, uh, public uh, defenders of science, and especially Darwinian evolution, tell us over and over again that uh, we are our genes, essentially. You know, take my DNA out of me and put it in someone else's egg, and I'll get a, you know, a photocopy of myself, which is biologically just nonsense. Uh, and as an embryologist myself, I actually set out to investigate processes in the early embryo that do not uh, depend on a program in the genes. And, and there's frankly quite a lot of evidence for things besides genetic programs. Many biologists know this, although they do not have the microphone, so to speak, so the public doesn't hear about it so much. But uh, the very term epigenetic, which means sort of outside or above the genes, uh, trades on the centrality of the DNA. I don't like the word myself uh, because I think it's the genes that are actually a relatively minor part of development. Uh, and so I did research on that and I, I studied several aspects of frog development that uh, go on, uh, that in, in my view actually help to control the DNA. It's not the other way around. The cell, the embryo, the organism is controlling its DNA which is essentially a protein factory. The DNA makes protein. The embryo tells the DNA in different cells to make this protein or that protein, but the DNA is not directing development. Obviously, this is a minority view in modern biology, uh, but it's not uh, by any means uh, unique to me. There are many biologists who think this way. Isn't developmental biology largely dependent upon Darwinian theory? Wouldn't it suffer without it? Well. Interestingly enough, I think the, the notion that evolutionary biology uh, is informing developmental biology and guiding its progress uh, is a mistaken notion. The fact is that uh, developmental biology, embryology, was effectively separate from Darwinian evolution for a century, more than a century. Uh, and read a history of the, you know, the history of Darwinism. You'll see that Darwinism wedded itself to population genetics, and sort of set development aside because development didn't seem to fit the paradigm. It's only been fairly recently that development has been brought under the umbrella of Darwinian evolution. And uh, to put it bluntly, uh, when Darwinists claim that nothing in developmental biology makes sense except in the light of their theory.
uh, I think of the Soviets claiming they invented the telephone. I mean, developmental biology owes nothing to evolutionary theory. Evolutionary theory is capitalizing on the insights from developmental biology to uh, uh, line its own pockets, so to speak. And, and the, the whole field of Evo Devo, of which I'm a part, uh, is very recent uh, and I think unfortunately has succumbed to this uh, rather doctrinaire idea that uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I think actually much of developmental biology poses a very serious problem for Darwinian theory. And that's what I love about it. Do you think an intelligent design paradigm could provide any insights into developmental biology or provide a foundation for future research? I think it does. Uh, first of all, it, uh, as I said earlier, it broadens the horizon. We're no longer constrained to limit ourselves to randomness and necessity. <clears throat> More particularly, Darwinian theory, modern neo-Darwinian theory, focuses attention very strongly on the DNA, which certainly plays a role in development. You can't live without it. But uh, it's not the whole story. In my opinion, it does not contain a program for development, but rather it's playing an important role. It's sort of controlled by the organism. So <clears throat> by considering a divine, uh, design uh, framework, moving beyond the neo-Darwinian framework, the researcher is freed to look more openly at non-genetic factors in development, which I think are very important. Even more than that, I think by expanding one's horizon through design thinking, one can begin to look at other kinds of cause in embryology. The naturalistic metaphysics of Darwinian evolution limits us to efficient cause and material cause. You know, you have matter and you have physical, you know, things bumping into each other that make things happen. But of course, in the classical world, there were two more causes, formal and final cause. Formal being that there's a certain form that uh, matter has to take. And final cause being that things move toward a goal. I think formal and final cause both play a role in embryo development. Other embryologists have thought the same way. Uh, Carl Ernst von Baer, uh, one of my heroes in the 19th century, a staunch anti-Darwinian, believed that you couldn't understand the development of the embryo without a teleological perspective, that is, final cause. Uh, Brian Goodwin in the United Kingdom, a uh, thoroughly competent and well-published embryologist, is pursuing the notion of formal cause in embryology, uh, sort of analogous to quantum mechanics. You have particles that have to conform to certain forms that are specified by mathematical equations. Uh, certainly life is much more complicated than that, but Goodwin is pursuing the idea that there are forms to which developing embryos uh, conform in their development. And uh, he's uh, actually made some progress with this in plant development. So I think uh, embryo development is far more mysterious than the Darwinian paradigm would lead us to believe, and that by expanding our horizon beyond that to design thinking, uh, we're liberated to examine these other aspects of development. And without that, I don't think we can understand how embryos develop. How does the new intelligent design movement differ from pre-Darwinian creationist thinking? In, in one sense, it is uh, a revival of old notions. In fact, uh, I, as, as a revolutionary myself in several ways, uh, it seems to me that most revolutions have in some way or another uh, reinvigorated an ancient idea, an earlier idea, and uh, found the virtue in it. And I think the design movement is doing that to some extent. Where it differs is uh, most people in the intelligent design movement of today are not Paleans. William Paley, at the turn of the 19th century, early 19th century, argued not only that certain features of living things are designed, but that they point to the Christian God. 
benevolent, omniscient, omnipotent, and so on and so forth. Um, as a design theorist myself, I do not believe that. I think that the evidence does point to design, but that to get from the design we see in living things to the nature of the designer, whatever it may be, requires many additional steps, theological, philosophical, and so on. Uh, now, I think those steps are worth taking, and I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but they go far beyond the scientific evidence. So, strictly speaking, as a scientist, I would argue that we can find evidence for design and bracket the question of the nature of the designer. For example, uh, I know people who believe in design, and now I'm not advocating any of the views I'm about to mention, but people who believe in design who think it came from aliens, from extraterrestrials, that design comes from uh, the Gaia hypothesis, that is a sort of a pantheistic idea that the, the world is God and uh, more like an organism than an inert object. Uh, design could come from, uh, you know, one of the deities of Hinduism, uh, which were designers. Uh, design, the designer could be, uh, as, as someone I know believes, thoroughly evil, you know, and have design, designed the world to make us miserable. <laughs> I don't believe that, but uh, design itself, per se, could be compatible with any number of these views. Uh, so I think the, the virtue of the modern intelligent design movement is that it's more self-critical about limiting itself to what the evidence can actually show and how we get there and bracketing these larger questions, not that they're unimportant, but just leaving them for discussion in other disciplines. You seem to infer that Darwinian theory is more akin to a materialistic creation story than empirical or historical science. What have been some of the fruits of philosophical materialism? Well, Daniel Dennett, a philosopher at uh, Tufts University in Boston, calls Darwinism the universal acid. And I think he's right. It's the universal acid that corrodes all traditional beliefs, religion, morality, uh, to me, all the things that make society uh, worth contributing to. Uh, this is a controversial area, but I think the, not Darwinism per se, but the atheism that underlies it and motivates its distortions of the evidence, uh, ultimately deprive people of their humanness, their moral standards, uh, their, uh, ultimately, their loving nature. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that there aren't Darwinists who express love and behave morally, but uh, the general effect, I think, has been to, uh, well, the main effect is to convince people that there's no higher being to whom we are responsible. One consequence of that is uh, the, gra the grand says who? Who's to say that my moral standards are any better than your moral standards? Because there's no absolute. I can make up mine, you can make up yours. And who's to say which one of us is right? Uh, well, I actually don't think that's the way the cosmos is constructed. I think there are absolute moral standards, regardless of whether I believe it or not. And so for someone to just decide that there are no such standards and become uh, to feel justified in behaving in other ways, I think uh, is, is very damaging to society, which in my opinion is coming unglued because of it. Uh, the value of human life. I mean, the, the idea of uh, treating a human embryo as a piece of meat, as basically a fish on its way to becoming a human, I think is, is one consequence of this. Uh, certainly, uh, the way Nazis treated the Jews was uh, in line with Darwinian evolution. Ernst Haeckel, who drew those famous uh, distorted drawings of embryos, drew other, made other drawings uh, to fit the Darwinian theory, showing Jews just above the apes in the evolutionary hierarchy. Uh, and this helped to justify treating them like animals. Uh, I think the same naturalistic view underlay Marxism with all its evils. You know, hundreds of 
millions of people slaughtered. Uh, now, typically, defenders of Darwinism will point to the excesses and evils perpetrated by religious people, and there's no denying that such things have happened. But on a purely uh, numerical level, when you look at the damage done by the Crusades or the Inquisition, uh, that damage pales to insignificance almost in comparison with the evils of 20th century uh, atheistic philosophies. And unfortunately, I think Darwinism is sort of a pseudo-scientific justification for that sort of thinking. 